Section 40 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3, Section 40. Excerpts by Sir Samuel White Baker. Sir Samuel White Baker, 1821-1893 to The Northwest Passage, the Pole itself, and the sources of the Nile, how many have struggled through ice and snow, or burned themselves with tropic heat, in the effort to penetrate these secrets of the earth, and how many have left their bones to whiten on the desert, or lie hidden beneath icebergs at the end of the search. Of the fortunate ones who escaped after many perils, Baker was one of the most fortunate. He explored the Blue and the White Nile, and discovered at least one of the reservoirs from which flows the great river of Egypt, and lived to tell the tale and to receive due honor, being knighted by the queen, therefore feted by learned societies, and sent subsequently to the Khedive at the head of a large force with commission to destroy the slave trade. In this he appears to have been successful for a time, but for a time only. Baker was born in London, June 8, 1821, and died December 30, 1893. With his brother he established, in 1847, a settlement in the mountains of Ceylon, where he spent several years. His experiences in the Far East appear in books entitled The Rifle and Hound in Ceylon and Eight Years Wandering in Ceylon. In 1861, accompanied by his young wife and an escort, he started up the Nile, and three years later, on the 14th of March, 1864, at length reached the cliffs overlooking the Albert Nianza, being the first European to behold its waters. Like most Englishmen, he was an enthusiastic sportsman, and his manner of life afforded him a great variety of unusual experiences. He visited Cyprus in 1879 after the execution of the convention between England and Turkey, and subsequently he traveled to Syria, India, Japan, and America. He kept voluminous notes of his various journeys, which he utilized in the preparation of numerous volumes. The Albert Nianza, the Nile tributaries of Abyssinia, Ismailia, a narrative of the expedition under the auspices of the Khedive. Cyprus, as I saw it in 1879, together with wild beasts and their ways, true tales for my grandsons, and a story entitled Cast Up by the Sea, which was for many years a great favorite with the boys of England and America. They are full of life and incident. One of the most delightful memories of them which readers retain is the figure of his lovely wife, so full of courage, loyalty, buoyancy, and charm. He had that rarest of possibilities, spirit-stirring adventure and home companionship at once. Hunting in Abyssinia From the Nile Tributaries of Abyssinia On arrival at the camp, I resolved to fire the entire country on the following day, and to push still farther up the course of the Setite to the foot of the mountains, and to return to this camp in about a fortnight, by which time the animals, that had been scared away by the fire, would have returned. Accordingly, on the following morning, accompanied by a few of the Agagirs, I started upon the south bank of the river, and rode for some distance into the interior, to the ground that was entirely covered with high withered grass. We were passing through a mass of kitar thorn bush, almost hidden by the immensely high grass, when, as I was ahead of the party, I came suddenly upon the tracks of rhinoceros. These were so unmistakably recent that I felt sure we were not far from the animals themselves. As I had wished to fire the grass, I was accompanied by my tokururus and my horse-keeper, Mahomet No. 2. It was difficult ground for the men, and still more unfavorable for the horses, 
as large disjointed masses of stone were concealed in the high grass we were just speculating as to the position of the rhinoceros and thinking how uncommonly unpleasant it would be should he obtain our wind when whiff 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 we heard the sharp whistling snort with a tremendous rush through the high grass and thorns close to us and at the same moment two of these determined brutes were upon us in full charge i never saw such a scrimmage sauvez qui peut there was no time for more than one look behind i dug the spurs into agar's flanks and clasping him round the neck i ducked my head down to his shoulder well protected with my strong hunting cap and i kept the spurs going as hard as i could ply them blindly trusting to providence and my good horse over big rocks, fallen trees, thick guitar thorns, and grass ten feet high. With the two infernal animals in full chase only a few feet behind me, I heard their abominable whiffing close to me, but so did my horse also, and the good old hunter flew over obstacles that I should have thought impossible, and he dashed straight under the hooked thorn bushes and doubled like a hare. The agagirs were all scattered. Mahomet number two was knocked over by a rhinoceros all the men were sprawling upon the rocks with their guns and the party was entirely discomfited having passed the kitter thorn i turned and seeing that the beasts had gone straight on i brought agar's head round and tried to give chase but it was perfectly impossible it was only a wonder that the horse had escaped in ground so difficult for riding Although my clothes were of the strongest and coarsest Arab cotton cloth, which seldom tore, but simply lost a thread when caught in a thorn, I was nearly naked. My blouse was reduced to shreds. As I wore sleeves only halfway from the shoulder to the elbow, my naked arms were streaming with blood. Fortunately, my hunting cap was secured with a chin strap, and still more fortunately, I had grasped the horse's neck otherwise i must have been dragged out of the saddle by the hooked thorns all the men were cut and bruised some having fallen upon their heads among the rocks and others had hurt their legs in falling in their endeavours to escape mahomet number two the horse-keeper was more frightened than hurt as he had been knocked down by the shoulder and not by the horn of the rhinoceros as the animal had not noticed him its attention was absorbed by the horse I determined to set fire to the whole country immediately, and, descending the hill toward the river to obtain a favorable wind, I put my men in a line, extending over about a mile along the river's bed, and they fired the grass in different places. With a loud roar, the flame leapt high in air and rushed forward with astonishing velocity. The grass was as inflammable as tender, and the strong north wind drove the long line of fire spreading in every direction through the country. We now crossed to the other side of the river to avoid the flames, and we returned toward the camp. On the way I made a long shot and badly wounded a tetel, but lost it in thick thorns. Shortly after, I stalked a nullet, a trepisurus, and bagged it with a Fletcher rifle. We arrived early in camp and on the following day we moved sixteen miles farther upstream and camped under a tamarind tree by the side of the river no european had ever been farther than our last camp Dela Dela, and that spot had only been visited by johann schmidt and florian in the previous year my agagirs had savored some of the besay at this very camping place they accordingly requested me to keep a vigilant watch during the night as they would be very likely to attack us in revenge, unless they had been scared by the rifles and by the size of our party. They advised me not to remain long in this spot, as it would be very dangerous for my wife to be left almost alone during the day when we were hunting, and that the Basset would be certain to espy us from the mountains, and would most probably attack and carry her off when they were assured of our departure. She was not very nervous about this, but she immediately called the dragoman, Mohammed, who knew the use of a gun, and she asked him if he would stand by her in case they were attacked in my absence. The faithful servant replied, Mohammed, fight the basset? No, missus. 
Mohammed not fight. If the Basse come, Missus fight. Mohammed run away. Mohammed not come all the way from Cairo to get him killed by black fellers. Mohammed will run. Inshallah. Please, God. This frank avowal of his military tactics was very reassuring. There was a high hill of basalt, something resembling a pyramid, within a quarter of a mile of us. I accordingly ordered some of my men every day to ascend this lookout station, and I resolved to burn the high grass at once, so as to destroy all cover for the concealment of an enemy. That evening I very nearly burned our camp. I had several times ordered the men to clear away the dry grass for about thirty yards from our resting place. This they had neglected to obey. We had been joined a few days before by a party of about a dozen Hamron Arabs, who were hippopotami hunters. Thus we mustered very strong, and it would have been the work of about half an hour to have cleared away the grass as I had desired. The wind was brisk and blew directly toward our camp, which was backed by the river. I accordingly took a fire stick, and I told my people to look sharp, as they would not clear away the grass. I walked to the foot of the basalt hill and fired the grass in several places. In an instant, the wind swept the flame and smoke toward the camp. All was confusion. The Arabs had piled the camel saddles and all their corn and effects in the high grass about twenty yards from the tent. There was no time to remove all these things. Therefore, unless they could clear away the grass so as to stop the fire before it should reach the spot, they would be punished for their laziness by losing their property. The fire traveled quicker than I had expected, and by the time I had hastened to the tent, I found the entire party working frantically. The Arabs were slashing down the grass with their swords, and sweeping it away with their shields, while my Tukroras were beating it down with long sticks and tearing it from its withered and fortunately tender rotten roots in desperate haste. The flames rushed on, and we already felt the heat as volumes of smoke enveloped us. I thought it advisable to carry the gunpowder, about twenty pounds, down to the river, together with the rifles, while my wife and Mohammed dragged the various articles of luggage to the same place of safety. The fire now approached within about sixty yards, and dragging out the iron pens, I let the tent fall to the ground. The Arabs had swept a line like a high road perfectly clean, and they were still tearing away the grass, when they were suddenly obliged to rush back as the flames arrived. Almost instantaneously the smoke blew over us, but the fire had expired upon meeting the cleared ground. I now gave them a little lecture upon obedience to orders, and from that day their first act upon halting for the night was to clear away the grass, lest I should repeat the entertainment. In countries that are covered with dry grass, it should be an invariable rule to clear the ground around the camp before night. Hostile natives will frequently fire the grass to windward of a party, or careless servants may leave their pipes upon the ground, which, fanned by the wind, would quickly create a blaze. That night the mountain afforded a beautiful appearance as the flames ascended the steep sides, and ran flickering up the deep gullies with a brilliant light. We were standing outside the tent admiring the scene which perfectly illuminated the neighborhood, when suddenly an apparition of a lion and lioness stood for an instant before us at about fifteen yards distance, and then disappeared over the blackened ground before I had time to snatch a rifle from the tent. No doubt they had been disturbed from the mountain by the fire, and had mistaken their way in the country so recently changed from high grass to black ashes. In this locality I considered it advisable to keep a vigilant watch during the night, and the Arabs were told off for that purpose. A little before sunrise I accompanied the Hawartus, or hippopotamus hunters, for a day's sport. There were numbers of hippos in this part of the river, and we were not long before we found a herd. The hunters failed in several attempts to harpoon them, but they succeeded in stalking a crocodile after a most peculiar fashion. 
This large beast was lying upon a sandbank on the opposite margin of the river, close to a bed of rushes. The Hawartis, having studied the wind, ascended for about a quarter of a mile, and then swam across the river, harpoon in hand. The two men reached the opposite bank, beneath which they alternately waded or swam down the stream toward the spot upon which the crocodile was lying. Thus, advancing under cover of the steep bank, or floating with the stream in deep places, and crawling like crocodiles across the shallows, the two hunters at length arrived at the bank of rushes, on the other side of which the monster was basking asleep upon the sand. They were now about waist-deep, and they kept close to the rushes with their harpoons raised, ready to cast, the moment they should pass the rush-bed and come in view of the crocodile. Thus steadily advancing, they had just arrived at the corner within about eight yards of the crocodile, when the creature either saw them or obtained their wind. In an instant it rushed to the water. At the same moment, the two harpoons were launched with great rapidity by the hunters. One glanced obliquely from the scales, the other stuck fairly in the tough hide, and the iron detached from the bamboo held fast, while the ambach float, running on the surface of the water, marked the course of the reptile beneath. The hunters chose a convenient place and recrossed the stream to our side, apparently not heeding the crocodiles more than we should pike when bathing in England. They would not waste their time by securing the crocodile at present, as they wished to kill a hippopotamus. The float would mark the position, and they would be certain to find it later. We accordingly continued our search for hippopotami. These animals appeared to be on the kivive, and as the hunters once more failed in an attempt, I made a clean shot behind the ear of one and killed it dead. At length we arrived at a large pool, in which were several sandbanks covered with rushes and many rocky islands. Among these rocks were a herd of hippopotami, consisting of an old bull and several cows. A young hippo was standing like an ugly little statue on a protruding rock, while another infant stood upon its mother's back that listlessly floated on the water. This was an admirable place for the hunters. They desired me to lie down, and they crept into the jungle out of view of the river. I presently observed them stealthily descending the dry bed about two hundred paces above the spot where the hippos were basking behind the rocks. They entered the river, and swam down the center of the stream toward the rock. This was highly exciting. The hippos were quite unconscious of the approaching danger, as, steadily and rapidly, the hunters floated down the strong current. They neared the rock, and both heads disappeared as they purposely sank out of view. In a few seconds later they reappeared at the edge of the rock upon which the young hippo stood. It would be difficult to say which started first, the astonished young hippo into the water, or the harpoons from the hands of the Howartis. It was the affair of a moment. The hunters dived directly. They had hurled their harpoons, and, swimming for some distance under water, they came to the surface and hastened to the shore, lest an infuriated hippopotamus should follow them. One harpoon had missed. The other had fixed the bull of the herd, at which it had been surely aimed. This was grand sport. The bull was in the greatest fury, and rose to the surface, snorting and blowing in its impotent rage. But, as the ambach float was exceedingly large, and this naturally accompanied his movements, he tried to escape from his imaginary persecutor and dived constantly, only to find his pertinacious attendant close to him upon regaining the surface. This was not to last long. The Hawartis were in earnest and they at once called their party, who, with two of the Agagirs, Abodo and Suleiman, were near at hand. These men arrived with the long ropes that form a portion of the outfit for hippo hunting. The whole party now halted on the edge of the river, while two men swam across with one end of the long rope. Upon gaining the opposite bank, I observed that a second rope was made fast to the middle of the main line, Thus, upon our side, we held the ends of two ropes, while on the opposite side they had only one. Accordingly, the point of junction of the two ropes in the center 
formed an acute angle. The object of this was soon practically explained. The two men upon our side now each held a rope, and one of these walked about ten yards before the other. Upon both sides of the river the people now advanced, dragging the rope on the surface of the water, until they reached the ambach float that was swimming to and fro, according to the movements of the hippopotamus below. By a dexterous jerk of the main line, the float was now placed between the two ropes, and it was immediately secured in the acute angle by bringing together the ends of these ropes on our side. The men on the opposite bank now dropped their line, and our men hauled in upon the ambach float that was held fast between the ropes. Thus, cleverly made sure, we quickly brought a strain upon the hippo, and although I have some experience in handling big fish, I never knew one pull so lustily as the amphibious animal that we now alternately coaxed and bullied. He sprang out of the water, gnashed his huge jaws, snorted with tremendous rage, and lashed the river into foam. He then dived and foolishly approached us beneath the water. We quickly gathered in the slack line and took a round turn upon a large rock within a few feet of the river. The hippo now rose to the surface, about ten yards from the hunters, and, jumping half out of the water, he snapped his great jaws together, endeavoring to catch the rope, but at the same instant two harpoons were launched into his side. Disdaining retreat and maddened with rage, the furious animal charged from the depths of the river, and, gaining a footing, he reared his bulky form from the surface, came boldly upon the sandbank, and attacked the hunters open-mouthed. He little knew his enemy. They were not the men to fear a pair of gaping jaws. Armed with a deadly array of tusks, but half a dozen lances were hurled at him, some entering his mouth from a distance of five or six paces. At the same time, several men threw handfuls of sand into his enormous eyes. This baffled him more than the lances, he crunched the shafts between his powerful jaws like straws, but he was beaten by the sand, and, shaking his huge head, he retreated to the river. During his sally upon the shore, two of the hunters had secured the ropes of the harpoons that had been fastened in his body just before his charge. He was now fixed by three of these deadly instruments, but suddenly one rope gave way, having been bitten through by the enraged beast who was still beneath the water. Immediately after this, he appeared on the surface, and without a moment's hesitation, he once more charged furiously from the water straight at the hunters, with his huge mouth open to such an extent that he could have accommodated two inside passengers. Suleiman was wild with delight, and, springing forward, lance in hand, he drove it against the head of the formidable animal, but without effect. At the same time, Abu Dhul met the hippo sword in hand, reminding me of Perseus slaying the sea monster that would devour Andromeda. But the sword made a harmless gash, and the lance, already blunted against the rocks, refused to penetrate the tough hide. Once more handfuls of sand were pelted upon his face, and again repulsed by this blinding attack, he was forced to retire to his deep hole and wash it from his eyes. Six times during the fight the valiant bull hippo quitted his watery fortress and charged resolutely at his pursuers. He had broken several of their lances in his jaws. Other lances had been hurled, and, falling upon the rocks, they were blunted and would not penetrate. The fight had continued for three hours, and the sun was about to set. Accordingly, the hunters begged me to give him the coup de grace as they had hauled him close to the shore, and they feared he would sever the rope with his teeth. I waited for a good opportunity, when he boldly raised his head from water about three yards from the rifle, and a bullet from the little fletcher between the eyes closed the last act. The Sources of the Nile From the Albert Nianza The name of this village was Parkani. For several days past, our guides had told us that we were very near to the lake, and we were now assured that we should reach it on the morrow. 
I had noticed a lofty range of mountains at an immense distance west, and I had imagined that the lake lay on the other side of this chain, but I was now informed that those mountains formed the western frontier of the Mutan Nzige, and that the lake was actually within a march of Parkani. I could not believe it possible that we were so near the object of our search. The guide Rabanga now appeared, and declared that if we started early on the following morning, we should be able to wash in the lake by noon. That night I hardly slept. For years I had striven to reach the sources of the Nile. In my nightly dreams during that arduous voyage, I had always failed. But after so much hard work and perseverance, the cup was at my very lips, and I was to drink at the mysterious fountain before another sun should set at that great reservoir of nature that ever since creation had baffled all discovery. I had hoped and prayed and striven through all kinds of difficulties, in sickness, starvation, and fatigue, to reach that hidden source, and when it had appeared impossible, we had both determined to die upon the road rather than return defeated. Was it possible that it was so near, and that tomorrow we could say, the work is accomplished the fourteenth march the sun had not risen when i was spurring my ox after the guide who having been promised a double handful of beads on arrival at the lake had caught the enthusiasm of the moment the day broke beautifully clear and having crossed a deep valley between the hills we toiled up the opposite slope i hurried to the summit the glory of our prize burst suddenly upon me there, like a sea of quicksilver, lay far beneath the grand expanse of water, a boundless sea horizon on the south and southwest, glittering in the noonday sun, and on the west, at fifty or sixty miles distance, blue mountains rose from the bosom of the lake to a height of about seven thousand feet above its level. It is impossible to describe the triumph of that moment. Here was the reward for all our labor for the years of tenacity with which we had toiled through Africa. England had won the sources of the Nile. Long before I reached the spot, I had arranged to give three cheers with all our men in English style in honor of the discovery, but now that I looked down upon the great inland sea lying nestled in the very heart of Africa, and thought how vainly mankind had sought these sources throughout so many ages, and reflected that I had been the humble instrument permitted to unravel this portion of the great mystery when so many greater than I had failed. I felt too serious to vent my feelings in vain cheers for victory, and I sincerely thanked God for having guided and supported us through all dangers to the good end. I was about fifteen hundred feet above the lake, and I looked down from the steep granite cliff upon those welcome waters, upon that vast reservoir which nourished egypt and brought fertility where all was wilderness upon that great source so long hidden from mankind that source of bounty and of blessings to millions of human beings and as one of the greatest objects in nature i determined to honor it with a great name as an imperishable memorial of one loved and mourned by our gracious queen and deplored by every Englishman, I called this great lake the Albert Nianza. The Victoria and the Albert Lakes are the two sources of the Nile. End of section 40